Want to speak real Italian from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at italianpod101.com. Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, do Italians only speak Italian or are there other languages commonly spoken in Italy? Italian is such a famous and beautiful language that many people only know about standard Italian. However, that's only half the story. Actually, many Italians are native bilinguals. Italian is the most widely spoken language in Italy, but there are lots of regional languages or dialects called dialetti. People don't really use dialects in official or formal settings. That's why Italian is the official language of Italy. It's necessary to have a common language everyone can understand and use together. For the most part, dialects are only spoken and used in casual situations. A few of the major dialects might sound familiar to you. The major ones are Napolitan, Sicilian, Sardinian, Venetian and Friulan. And there are a lot more. You probably won't be able to find a full list of dialetti online. There are two main reasons why. Dialects don't have a written literature, so few documents have been written about them. In fact, most children learn a dialetto at the same time they learn standard Italian. The difference is that Italian is what's used in schools, while dialects are used with family and friends. Some people consider dialects as the only language that can truly express one's innermost feelings. Unfortunately, many children today don't learn any dialetti at all. So, if you go to Italy and you overhear an unfamiliar phrase, it might not even be in Italian. It could be a phrase from one of the many Italian dialects. Isn't that interesting? If you have any more questions, leave them in the comments below. A presto! Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, does Italian have any false friends words that look the same in English but mean something different? The answer is yes. The term false friends is the perfect name for these words. They are like people who look really familiar but are actually total strangers. We'll go through some of the most common ones, so you can avoid miscommunications when you're speaking Italian. If your Italian partner is going to introduce you to his or her parenti, you'll be meeting their relatives, not just the parents. The word parents is genitori in Italian. Also, if you see the word sale in a supermarket, don't think you're getting a discount. Sale is actually the Italian word for salt. If someone describes you as educato or educata, they are usually not talking about your education. They are saying that you are polite. And if you work in a factory, don't say you work in a fattoria. That means you work for, on a farm. If you are a librarian, don't work in a libreria because that's bookshop. So don't think that you can borrow books there for free. Make sure you don't offer to take pictures with your camera. That means room. You take pictures on your macchina fotografica. Pay attention to adverbs too. Attualmente means currently in Italian. The Italian for actually is in realtà. Definitely doesn't translate as definitivamente either, that means ultimately. Lastly, when you're talking about an event that's coming up later than expected, don't use eventualmente for eventually. Eventualmente means possibly, and of course there are many more. Got it? Keep the questions coming, if you have another question, leave it in the comments and I'll try to answer it. A presto! Hi! Welcome to Introduction to Italian. My name is Alicia and I'm joined by... Hi everyone! I'm Marika. In this lesson you'll learn the basics of Italian grammar. 
Word order refers to the order in which words are structured to form a sentence in a given language. Consider the English sentence, I ate an apple. But first, let's remove the article an here for simplicity. So we're just left with, I ate apple. The basic word order for English is subject, verb, object, or SVO for short. If we break down the English sentence, I ate apple, we can see that the subject I is presented first, followed by the verb ate, and then finally the object apple is positioned last. This is the basic word order for sentences in English. Now let's compare that same sentence, I ate an apple, in Italian. Io ho mangiato una mela. Like before, let's remove the article to keep it simple, so we are just left with the words. If we break down the Italian sentence, we get the subject io, meaning I, then comes the verb ho mangiato, meaning ate, and finally we have the object mela, meaning apple. The basic word order for Italian then is SBO. It's the same as English. This means that you can convert an English sentence into Italian simply by replacing the English words with Italian words, and you'll still be understood. Italian word order, however, is much more flexible than English. If we swapped the subject and object around, we'd get apple ate I in English, which changes the meaning of the sentence completely. In Italian, however, the core meaning of the sentence does not change. It would still essentially be I ate apple. Me la ho mangiato io. As you can see, the word order of Italian is quite flexible. More often than not, if you wanted to say I ate an apple in Italian, you would not say Io ho mangiato una mela. Instead, you would more likely say ate an apple in Italian. Ho mangiato una mela. This is because Italian is a null subject language where the word for the pronoun is omitted because it's already implied. This is because all of the information can be derived from the way the verb is conjugated in the sentence. For example, the verb aprire means to open. When you conjugate it, it changes according to the subject. Hai aperto la scatola means you open the box. Hanno aperto la scatola means they opened the box. Let's take a look at another example. Tornare means to return. Siamo tornati a casa in treno means we return home by train. Sono tornata a casa in treno means I return home by train. Can you see how the subject changes based on the way the verb is conjugated in the sentence? Okay, let's move on. Negating a sentence in Italian is incredibly simple. All you have to do is to put the word non in front of the verb. Let's go back to the original example, I ate an apple. The verb here is ate or ho mangiato in Italian. Ho mangiato una mela. To make this sentence negative, simply add non before the verb ho mangiato. Non ho mangiato una mela. If it were Carla ate an apple, it would be Carla ha mangiato una mela. Adding non before the verb would make it negative. Carla non ha mangiato una mela. Siamo tornati a casa in treno. Non siamo tornati a casa in treno. You can create any negative sentence in Italian simply by adding non before the verb. Asking a question in Italian is even easier than making it negative. All you have to do is simply raise the pitch at the end of a sentence to turn it into a question. Hai aperto la scatola. Hai aperto la scatola? No rearranging of words is needed. Hai aperto la scatola. Hai aperto la scatola? You can create any basic yes-no questions in Italian this way. If you want to be a little more specific, simply add the question word in front of the question. For example, perché means why. Perché hai aperto la scatola? Quando means when. Quando hai aperto la scatola? And come means how. Come hai aperto la scatola? 
Now you know how to create questions in Italian. Well done! We've covered a lot of things in this lesson, so let's recap what we've learned. In this lesson, you learned that Italian sentences can be formed using a subject, verb, object, or SVO word order. Italian tends to omit the subject if that subject is a pronoun. You make a sentence negative by adding non before the verb. To turn a sentence into a question, simply raise your pitch at the end. And if you want to be more specific, just add a question word at the beginning of the question. Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, what are some examples of Italian loan words we use in everyday English? You may not know it, but you probably use some Italian every day. Did you know that bravo, dilemma and paparazzi are Italian words? English is full of Italian loan words. We use them in almost every aspect of our lives, especially in art, music, cuisine and architecture. The most obvious is probably cuisine. I'm sure you've seen silly people try to imitate Italian by saying spaghetti, cappuccino, espresso, mozzarella, maccheroni. Well, they are actually Italian words. You might have seen al dente or pasta fresca, which means fresh pasta, on English pasta packages. Those are two different ways to prepare pasta. Did you know that the words zucchini and broccoli are also from Italian? Music and art also have plenty of Italian loan words. Take finale, scenario, solo and concerto. Those are all commonly used in English. There are lots more on a technical level too, like forte, fortissimo, piano, pianissimo, motto, stanza. In arts and architecture, studio, villa, graffiti, veranda and ghetto, as well as apartment, from appartamento, are all Italian loan words. The list doesn't end here. Umbrella comes from the Italian ombrello, lottery comes from lotteria, and tombola is also an Italian game. Madonna, Monsignor, and Padre are all loan words related to religion. Scherzo in Italian means joke, and novel comes from the Italian novella. Sonnet comes from sonetto. Italian is everywhere. Be careful with some loan words though. The Italian word doesn't always mean the same thing in English. For example, manifesto in Italian means poster. English loan words don't always follow Italian grammar either. Zucchini and macaroni are spelled differently in Italian. English words like panini and salami are mistakenly used in the plural form. Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments and I'll try to answer them. A presto! Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, how can I use the pronoun NE? NE is an Italian pronoun that takes the place of nouns so that we don't have to repeat the same words. These nouns can refer to people, places or things. Let's take a look at how it can be used. First, NE can be used when replacing a noun introduced by DI or any combination like DEL, DELLA and so on. In this case, it has a partitive meaning. It can be translated as ANY, SOME, OF IT, OF THEM. For example, HAI BISOGNO DI SOLDI? Sì, ne ho bisogno. Do you need some money? Yes, I need some. Abbiamo del burro? No, non ne abbiamo. Do we have any butter? No, we don't have any of it. Ne can also replace nouns introduced by a number or an expression of quantity. Let's see some examples. Quante borse hai? Ne ho solo tre. How many purses do you have? I have only three. Vuoi dello zucchero nel caffè? Sì, ne vorrei due cucchiaini. Would you like some sugar in your coffee? Yes, I'd like two spoons. We also use NE to replace nouns phrases introduced by the preposition DI with specific verbs. Here are some examples. Parlare DI, meaning to talk about. 
Let's see a sample sentence. You can say, domani parleremo del problema, meaning, tomorrow we'll talk about the problem. If it's clear what you are going to talk about, you can use ne and say, domani ne parleremo. This means, we'll talk about it tomorrow. In this case, ne replaces the phrase, del problema. Another similar case is accorgersi di, meaning to notice. You can either say, non mi sono accorto di questo errore, I didn't notice this mistake, or if it's clear what you're talking about, you can say, non me ne sono accorto, I didn't notice it. Now, let's see where to put this little word in a sentence. Usually, we position ne before the conjugated verb. For example, ne vuoi ancora? Would you like more? In negative statements, it's always between the negation non and the verb. Vuoi un altro bicchiere di spumante? No, non ne voglio. Do you want another glass of sparkling wine? No, I don't want. In addition, we can attach it to an infinitive or a gerund. Non voglio più berne, grazie. I don't want to drink anymore, thank you. Here we've put together the infinitive bere and ne, making berne. Here is an example with a gerund. Avendone bevuto troppo, ora non si sente bene. Having drunk too much, now he doesn't feel well. There are several rules, so at first try memorizing and actually using a few expressions with ne. You'll eventually get the hang of it. Start with these three. Che ne pensi? What do you think about it? Non ce n'è più. There is no more of it. Ne vuoi? Do you want some? They are pretty simple, right? If you have any more questions, please leave us a comment below. A presto. See you soon. Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is what is gerundio? Gerundio, or in English gerund, is a verb non-finite mood. This means that you don't need to conjugate it. It's very similar to the continuous form of English verbs ending in ing. As we said, it's very convenient as you don't need to conjugate it. It only has two endings. Ando for verbs ending in are and endo for verbs ending in ere and ire. Another reason why it's easy is that it only has two tenses, present and past. Here are some verbs in the present gerund. Parlando, talking, from parlare to talk. Cadendo, falling, from cadere to fall. Dormendo, sleeping, from dormire to sleep. To form the past gerund, use the right auxiliary essere, to be, or avere, to have, in the present gerund, plus the past participle of the main verb. Here is the past gerund of the same verbs. Avendo parlato, having talked. Essendo caduto, having fallen. Avendo dormito, having slept. You can use the gerund alone for two actions happening at the same time. Studio, ascoltando la musica. I study listening to music. To say why something happens. Essendo stanca, andrò a letto. Being tired, she went to bed. To express a possibility, a hypothesis. Volendo, potremmo andare al cinema. If he wanted to, we could go to the movies. Another way you can use the gerund is combined with the verb stare. To stay, to be. If you combine the present tense of stare and the gerund, you get the present continuous. For example, sto studiando italiano. I am studying Italian. Tu stai leggendo. You are reading. If you combine the imperfect tense of stare and the gerund, you get the past continuous. Stavo studiando italiano. I was studying Italian. Tu stavi leggendo. You were reading. Pretty easy, right? If you have any more questions, please leave us a comment. 
Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, when should I use the subjunctive or congiuntivo? The subjunctive is a verb mood used to express doubt, hope, fear, or possibility. In other words, the subjunctive expresses subjectivity. Basically, you need it to express anything that isn't a sure fact. So, where should you use the subjunctive? In subordinate clauses introduced by a verb expressing doubt, a supposition or a guess. Look at the difference between these two sentences. So che sei stato tu, indicative, versus penso che sia stato tu, subjunctive. I know it was you, versus I think it was you. I know holds the same meaning as I'm sure, I know for a fact. Therefore, you don't need a subjunctive. In the second sentence, penso, I think, means I believe, but I'm not 100% sure. Therefore, it requires the subjunctive. Let's go ahead. You also need the subjunctive in subordinate clauses introduced by a thinking verb. This may express desire, hope, will, but never effect. Here is an example. Spero che tu possa venire alla festa. I hope you can come to the party. Another case is when you're talking about other people's feelings and thoughts. Again, these are things that you can never be sure 100%. For example, Sono contenta che ti piaccia il mio libro. I'm happy that you like my book. You need to use the subjunctive after certain conjugations. Sebbene, although, benché, although, affinché, so that, dovunque, wherever, nonostante, despite, prima che, before. For example, sebbene fosse tardi, la chiamai. Although it was late, I called her. Diglielo, prima che sia troppo tardi. Tell him, before it's too late. You should use the subjunctive after impersonal expressions such as Bisogna che, it's necessary that. È necessario che, it's necessary that. È possibile che, it's possible that. È probabile che. It's probable that. For example, è probabile che piova domani. It's probable that it will rain tomorrow. To form the polite imperative. Italian imperative doesn't have all the persons, so the third person borrows its form from the present subjunctive. Prego, si sieda. Please, have a seat. Finally, you need a subjunctive in the if clauses of the second and third conditional. You'll study this later. For now, here is an example. Se lo sapessi, te lo direi. If I knew, I'd tell you. Colloquial Italian often replaces the subjunctive with the indicative. It's not unusual to hear prima che te ne vai, before you leave, instead of prima che tu te ne vada. Or you might hear sono contenta che ti piace, I'm happy you like it, instead of, sono contenta che ti piaccia. This is actually a very controversial topic. Some people don't accept these examples as correct Italian, but language is a living thing, so who knows how it'll change in the future. Pretty interesting, right? If you have any more questions, please leave us a comment. A presto, see you soon. Want to get cheat sheets, audiobooks, lessons, apps, and much more every month for free? Just click the link in the description to get your free language gifts of the month. Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, why don't I always need to conjugate the verb in a subordinate clause? Sometimes Italian seems simpler than English because it can have an infinitive verb, whereas English has a conjugated form. For example, lui sa di avere ragione. He knows he is right. Why is avere not conjugated? What are the rules that regulate this? The sentence in the example above can be divided into two clauses. Lui sa di, 
meaning he knows that, is the main clause. Avere ragione, literally, to be right, is the subordinate clause. In English, it's translated as he is right. This is a special kind of subordinate clause called implicit. Implicit subordinate clauses future a non-finite mood verb, which means not conjugable verb. Infinitive is the most used in Italian. If the subject of the main clause and the subordinate is the same, the infinitive can replace clauses beginning with che. Sounds complicated. Look at these examples. Non sono sicura che partirò. I'm not sure I will leave. You can say, non sono sicura di partire. Mario sa che è bravo in matematica. Mario knows he's good at math. You can say, Mario sa di essere bravo in matematica. When the subject in the two sentences is the same and the first verb is a thinking verb, your only option is to use the infinitive in the second sentence. So, if you want to say, I hope I will leave, you have to say, Spero di partire, not spero che io parta. The second one is too wordy and sounds unnatural. However, if the subjects are different, you must use the subjunctive. Spero che Laura parta. I hope Laura will leave. Pretty simple, right? If you have any more questions, please leave us a comment. A presto, see you soon. Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher where I will answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is essere o avere? How can I choose the right auxiliary verb in compound verbs? In Italian, when forming compound tenses, such as the present perfect or passato prossimo, you'll need an auxiliary verb. This will either be essere, to be, or avere, to have. In English, you don't have to make this choice, as you only need to have. That's why deciding which auxiliary to use in Italian can be a bit difficult at first. Let's have a look at some rules that will help you choose the right auxiliary. The first thing you need to remember is that transitive verbs always need avere. Let's see some examples. Io ho mangiato una mela. I have eaten an apple. Mangiare, to eat, is a transitive verb, meaning that it can have a direct object. Giorgio ha guardato un film. Giorgio has watched a movie. Guardare, to watch, is also transitive. Abbiamo conosciuto Laura. We have met Laura. Conoscere, to meet, is also transitive. Reflexive verbs, on the other hand, always use essere. Let's see an example. Mi sono innamorato. I have fallen in love. Innamorarsi, to fall in love, is reflexive. Verbs in the passive form also use essere. La mela è stata mangiata. The apple has been eaten. È stata mangiata, meaning has been eaten, is a passive form of mangiare, to eat. What about intransitive verbs? Some use essere and others avere. Although there are no set rules, here are some things you can look out for. For example, intransitive verbs of movement always use essere, such as andare, to go, and arrivare, to arrive. Here are two sample sentences. Ieri sono andata a Venezia. Yesterday I went to Venice. Siete arrivati tardi. You have arrived late. On the other hand, intransitive verbs of movement, where the destination doesn't need to be mentioned, always use avere. Some examples are camminare, to walk, or viaggiare, to travel. A few sample sentences. Abbiamo camminato tanto. We have walked a lot. Ho viaggiato in treno. I've traveled by train. One last thing. There are some cases where both essere and avere are acceptable. This mainly happens with verbs about the weather. Piovere, to rain. Nevicare, to snow. Grandinare, to hail, tuonare, to thunder. So you can say è piovuto, but also ha piovuto. Both means it has rained. Pretty interesting, right? If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below. 
A presto. See you soon. Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, what's the difference between potere and riuscire? Riuscire and potere are two verbs we use very often in Italian. Sometimes their meanings overlap, but other times they mean completely different things. Potere is translated as to be able to or can. It indicates the capacity and or possibility to do a determinate action. For example, non devi cucinare, posso farlo io. You don't have to cook, I can do it. Potere is an irregular verb, but more importantly, it's a modal verb. Modal verbs are used to give additional information about the main verb. As with other modal verbs, Potere is almost always followed by an infinitive verb without a linking preposition. For example, Posso andare alla festa? Can I go to the party? Sometimes we can use another verb, riuscire. In English, this can be translated in the same way as potere. However, riuscire has a slightly different meaning. Its meaning is somewhere between the English verbs to be able to and to succeed. Let's see some examples. Non riesco a dormire, c'è troppo rumore. I can't sleep, there is too much noise. Sono riuscita ad arrivare in tempo. I managed to arrive on time. Please also note that riuscire needs the preposition a in front of the infinitive. It's not always easy to grasp the difference between these two verbs. Look at these sentences. Ho 15 anni. Non posso guidare. I'm 15. I can't drive. It's the same as saying, I'm not allowed to drive. Sono troppo stanca. Non riesco a guidare. I'm too tired. I can't drive. It's the same as saying, even if I tried, I couldn't. Here is another example that may help. We can translate I can't sleep at the office in two different ways in Italian. One is non posso dormire in ufficio. The other one non riesco a dormire in ufficio. The first one is the most likely as it means that I can't sleep because of the office rules. The second one instead means something like I can't manage sleeping at the office. The speaker can't sleep not because of the rules, but because of the noise or another secondary reason. Sometimes it doesn't matter which verb you choose. For example, you could say Non posso venire alla festa or Non riesco a venire alla festa. Though their nuance is different, the meaning is the same. I can't go to the party. To recap, keep in mind that there are some situations where you can't use riuscire to express the same meaning. Situations like when you ask for permission, posso uscire? Can I go out? When you ask for someone's help, qualcuno può aiutarmi? Can anyone help me? When you make a suggestion, potresti provare? Could you try? Pretty interesting, right? If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below. Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, how do reflexive verbs work? Reflexive verbs are one of those elements that don't really have an English counterpart. A verb in Italian is reflexive when the subject carries out the action on itself. Please note that not all verbs can be reflexive. The infinitive form of a reflexive verb is made by dropping the infinitive ending e from are, ere, and ire, and adding the pronoun si. For example, svegliare, svegliarsi, to wake up. Reflexive verbs, when conjugated, are preceded by a reflexive pronoun that complies with the subject. Let's see an example. Vestire, to dress. Ps, vestirsi, reflexive form to get dressed. Maria veste il manichino. Vs. Maria si veste. In the first example, the object of the verb vestire is the mannequin, while in the second sentence the object is Maria herself. Subject and object coincide. The reflexive pronoun si is conjugated as follows. 
Io mi vesto. I get dressed. Tu ti vesti. You get dressed. Lei si veste. She gets dressed. Noi ci vestiamo. We get dressed. Voi vi vestite. You get dressed. Loro si vestono. They get dressed. In compound tenses, reflexive verbs have essere to be as auxiliary verb. So we always form the passato prossimo of the reflexive verbs with essere. Let's see some examples. Maria si è vestita. Maria has got dressed. Ci siamo svegliati. We have woken up. We can also use reflexive verbs as reciprocal verbs. The subject is always plural. The reciprocity of the action that the verb expresses often translates in English as each other, for example. Noi ci amiamo. We love each other. Loro si salutano. They say hello to each other. It's easier than you thought, right? If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below. A presto. See you soon. Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is What are masculine and feminine nouns and how are they different? In Italian, all nouns have a gender. A noun can either be masculine or feminine. That applies to plural nouns too and to all the words that can modify nouns, such as articles and adjectives. Other Romance languages have similar system of masculine and feminine nouns. It's a trait that comes from Latin. The gender depends on the origin of the Latin word. English doesn't have masculine and feminine nouns though. So the easiest way for English speakers to tell a noun's gender is by looking at the last letter of the noun. If a noun ends with O in the singular, and E in the plural, it's usually masculine. If a noun ends with A in the singular and E in the plural, it's usually feminine. For example, sedia, meaning chair, ends with an A, so it's feminine. La sedia. In the plural, le sedie. Libro, meaning book, ends with an O, so it's masculine. Il libro. And in the plural, i libri ending with an I. The OI for masculine and AE for feminine rule doesn't always work though. Most of the time, but not always. There are some exceptions like la moto, meaning the bike, which is feminine, and il problema, meaning the problem, which is actually masculine. To make things even more complicated, there is a third class of nouns ending with E in the singular and I in the plural. These can be masculine or feminine depending on the word. That's why it's important to learn nouns and their respective genders together with the right definite articles. The definite articles are different from each gender, so they'll help you remember. For example, take bicchiere, meaning glass which is in that third category of nouns ending in E. The right article for bicchiere is il, so il bicchiere is masculine. How about nave, meaning ship? The right article for this one is la, so la nave is feminine. Again, there is unfortunately no formula to find the right gender. The Latin origins of words go way back and often people don't know why some words have a certain gender today. Your best guide is going to be our first rule, singular O and plural I for masculine and singular A, plural E for feminine. Just try to memorize the articles with the nouns and before you know it, the gender classifications will come naturally to you. Woo! That's it for this lesson. Please send in any more questions you have and I'll try to answer them. Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, how do you form the plural of nouns? In Italian, just like in English, nouns can be singular or 
plural depending on what they refer to. To form the plural of Italian nouns, you generally have to change the final letter of the singular form from one vowel to another. Masculine nouns ending in O and A form the plural by changing the final vowel to I. For example, ragazzo, meaning boy, becomes ragazzi in the plural. And the plural of poeta, which means poet, is poeti. Feminine nouns ending in A form the plural by changing the A to E. So, mela, meaning apple, changes to mele when it means apples. Finally, there are also nouns ending in E. Both masculine and feminine nouns that end in E form the plural by changing the final vowel to I. Let's take cane, for example, which means dog, and is masculine. The plural form is cani. Similarly, the plural of chiave, a feminine noun meaning key, is chiavi. However, not all nouns follow these rules. In fact, there are lots of exceptions. Let's see a few of them. Some nouns don't change in the plural. You can still tell if a noun is plural because the definite article or its adjective will be in the plural form, but the noun itself doesn't change. Among the words that remain unchanged in plural, there are all nouns ending in accent vowels like caffè, meaning coffee, or città, meaning city. Foreign nouns ending in a consonant, for example, computer, film, or sport. Singular nouns that end in I, crisi, meaning crisis, or brindisi, meaning toast. Monosyllable nouns, for example, re, which means king. Some nouns have an irregular plural form. For example, man in Italian is uomo, while men is uomini. And there are even Italian nouns that change gender when they become plural. For example, finger is masculine in the singular form, il dito, but becomes feminine in the plural, le dita. Plurals sometimes can be a challenge even for native Italian speakers. However, exceptions are exceptions. You shouldn't obsess over them. Just memorize the few rules I told you in the beginning and go from there. Pretty interesting, right? If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below. A presto! Want to speak real Italian from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at italianpod101.com. Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, what are modified nouns? In Italian, you can modify nouns. That allows you to convey feelings such as love, hate or irony in a concise and effective way. Modified nouns, called nomi alterati, can take different endings that convey different feelings. They are usually divided into categories. Let's see which ones. To describe something positively or negatively, you can use pezzeggiativi and dispregiativi. Pezzeggiativi express endearment. Some common suffixes are uccio and ino. For example, tesoruccio, sweetheart, gattino, kitten. Dispregiativi express dislike. Common suffix are accio and astro, for example, scarpaccia, ugly shoe, giovinastro, loud. To describe the aspect of something, you can use accrescitivi and diminutivi. Accrescitivi indicate a big size. The most common suffix is one, for example, ragazzone, big boy, nasone, big nose. Diminutivi indicate smallness. Common suffixes are ino, etto, otto, ello. For example, topino, little mouse, bacetto, small kiss, leprotto, small hair, alberello, little tree. Be aware of fake modified nouns or falsi alterati. 
these are words that look like modified nouns but mean a total different thing. Matto means crazy person, but mattone is not a big crazy man, it's a brick. And mulino means mill, not a small mule, that's mulo. Italian children often learn funny nursery rhymes in school about these false modified nouns. Here is one I just invented. Ready? Take note. La gomma per cancellare. Il gommone per andare al mare. Col burro puoi cucinare, ma del burrone non scivolare. Se vedi un lampo, c'è il temporale. Se vedi un lampone, lo puoi mangiare. Which means the eraser to erase, the raft to go out to the sea. With butter you can cook, but don't sleep on the ravine. If you see lightning, that's a storm. If you see a raspberry, you can eat it. Pretty fun, right? Do you know any other false modifying noun? Let us know in the comments. A presto. See you soon. Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, what are the top 10 most common Italian idioms? It might not be necessary to know idioms in order to communicate in Italian, but they are very effective and fun. Also, if you can use some idioms, you'll sound more fluent. Are you ready to find out 10 of the most common Italian idioms? Let's start. In bocca al lupo. This literally means into the mouth of the wolf. The origin of this expression isn't clear, but Italians use it very, very often to wish someone good luck. If someone says in bocca al lupo to you, you should reply crepi il lupo. May the wolf croak. Costare un occhio dalla testa. Literally, to cost an eye of the head. This has basically the same meaning as the English idiom, to cost an arm and a leg. It means that something costs so much that you'd have to sell a part of your body to be able to afford it. Essere al verde. The literal translation is to be at the green, but it actually means to be broke. This expression is said to have originated in Florence where the bottom half of auctioneer candles were painted green. When the candle reached the green, the flow of money would come to a stop. Another theory is that the color refers to the inside of a wallet, which you could see once you were out of money. Tra il dire e il fare c'è di mezzo il mare. Idiomatic expressions about the sea are quite common in Italian. This one means between saying and doing, there is a C in the middle. It means easier said than done. Italians often shorten this expression and just say tra il dire e il fare. Una volta ogni morte di papa. Once every time a pope dies. The English equivalent of this expression is once in a blue moon. Both are used about something happening very rarely. Essere al settimo cielo. This idiom has the perfect analog in English, to be in seventh heaven, meaning to be extremely happy. This expression comes from the philosophy on which Dante's comedy is based. According to this philosophy, the earth is in the center of the universe, surrounded by seven concentric heavens. Seventh heaven was the highest degree of elevation for man. Dormire come un sasso, to sleep like a stone. This idiom is basically the same as English. To sleep like a log. It means that someone is sleeping so soundly that they look like an inanimate object. You can also say dormire come un giro. To sleep like a dormouse. Acqua in bocca. The literal translation is water in your mouth. If someone says acqua in bocca to you, they want you to keep it a secret. Because of course, you can't say anything if your mouth is full of water. Il gioco non vale la candela. The game isn't worth the candle. This expression is of medieval origin. Back then, people used candles at night, and candles could be expensive. Card players used to repay the owner of the house that hosted them with either money or a candle. 
The saying started to spread among players to indicate games where the winnings were so low that they wouldn't even cover the small expense left for the candle. Tagliare la corda, to cut the rope. This expression means to run away from a situation. It originates from the rope that was used to keep boats tied to the shore. To sail, it was necessary to free the boat first, but if someone was in great hurry, the rope would be cut. Pretty interesting, right? That's all for this lesson and this series. Thank you for listening and we'll see you in another series. A presto! See you soon! Hi guys, I'm Desiree and today we're gonna do the top 25 Italian phrases that means useful words in Italian. Ciao! Hello! Ciao is the first word and it's a really useful word because you can use that to your friends to say ciao, ciao, but not to people that you don't really know. Buongiorno. Good morning. Buongiorno, that means good morning, and you can use it with friends or even with people that you don't know. So, buongiorno, buongiorno. And people can even answer to you back, ciao, that it's okay, but use buongiorno with everyone and you will be safe. Buonanotte. Good night. Buonanotte. So, good night. You can use it, of course, in the night, but it's a word that we don't really use to people that we don't know. So, it's like ciao. If people say to you ciao to say bye, you can answer buonanotte, but just if you know that they're really going to bed. Otherwise, it's good evening. So, buonasera. Sono desire. I'm desire. Sono, that means I am. You can use it with your nationality. So, I'm Italian. Sono italiana. Or with your name. I'm Desiree. Sono Desiree. Mi chiamo Desiree. My name is Desiree. Mi chiamo Desiree means my name is Desiree. And you can use that to introduce yourself to people that you may know that you don't know. It's okay because it's formal and informal at the same time. It's okay. Mi chiamo Desiree. Come ti chiami? What's your name? Come ti chiami? So, what's your name? Mi chiamo Desiree. Tu come ti chiami? Piacere di conoscerti. Nice to meet you. You will always use piacere di conoscerti. Come stai? How are you? Come stai? That means how are you? But it's something that you use with your friends, not really with people that you don't know, because in that case it would be something like come sta? Bene, grazie. E tu? I'm fine, thanks. And you? Bene, grazie. E tu? That means fine, thanks. And you? Per favore, please. Then we have a really useful word that is per favore, that means please. So you can put it at the end of any phrase and it will give you a nice way of asking. Even if you don't know how, how to say may or can, just add per favore and it will help you. Grazie. Thank you. And to say thank you, you will say grazie. Grazie. Prego. You're welcome. And to answer you're welcome, you have prego. So if you ask something and add per favore at the end, and then the people will do something, you can say grazie, and the other one will answer prego. Sì. Yes. Sì, that means yes. Of course, it's really useful because vuoi mangiare qualcosa? Would you like something to eat? Sì. Yes. No. No. And if you manage to say no, because it's hard to say no to an Italian offering you some food, then you can say no. But it's the same Italian and English, no. Va bene. Okay. Then we have va bene, that means okay. So again, when people ask you, do you want this? You can say va bene, so it's okay. Scusi. Excuse me. Scusi, that means excuse me. But to people that you don't really know, so would be like, excuse me, do you know where, th where the station is? Scusa, sai dove la stazione? Scusa. I'm sorry. If you know the people you're talking to, you should use scusa, that means I'm sorry. Che ora è? What time is it? Che ora è? That means what time is it? You can use it in a formal or informal way, it's the same, so you can say scusa, che ora è? Or scusi, che ora è? It's the same. Dove è la stazione? Where is the station? When you want to know where some place is, so where is location, you will say dove è la stazione? 
that is, for example, the station. Posso usare il bagno? May I use the restroom? When you need to ask permission for something, you will use the word posso, that means can I? So in this case, posso usare il bagno? Can I use the toilet? And I would add please, so per favore? And the answer would be yes, sure. Sì, prego, grazie. Vorrei qualcosa da mangiare. I would like something to eat. When you need something, you can use the word vorrei, that means I would like to. So vorrei mangiare, I would like to eat. Vorrei bere, I would like to drink. Vorrei dormire, I would like to sleep. Uh, we can go on forever, but still, vorrei, and then add the verb that you need. Posso avere il conto? Can I get the check? When you finish to eat and you want to check, you can say, posso avere il conto? That means, can I have the check? And if you want to be more polite, you can say, posso avere il conto, per favore? That means, can I have the check, please? A presto. See you soon. When you say bye to your friends and you don't really know when you're going to meet them again, you will say a presto, that means see you soon. A dopo, see you later. If you know that you're going to meet them later on, you can say a dopo, that means see you later. Dove posso mangiare la pizza? That means where can I eat a pizza? If you really no want to know where you can eat a good pizza, you can add buon, that means good, So it will be, dove posso mangiare una buona pizza? Of course, you cannot use pizza, but another type of food that you really want to eat. And that would be maybe lasagna or maybe gelato. So you can say, dove posso mangiare un buon gelato? Or, dove posso mangiare una buona lasagna? We learned how to ask, how are you? And to answer, I'm fine, thanks. But what about if you're not really fine? So you can say, così così, that means more or less or male, that means bad, really bad. Guys, that's it for today. We finished the top 25 Italian phrases. And which one was your favorite one? Mine is mm, così così, that if you remember means mm, not so well. But anyway, remember to subscribe. Bye bye. Ci vediamo. People, what, what, that, 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 that. Hey, to introduce... To... Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I will answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, what's the difference between in and a? In and a are two Italian prepositions. While each preposition has its own function, sometimes it's not easy to tell which one to use. In fact, both in and a can indicate place, but when should I use one instead of the other? The first point you should remember is that a is used before the name of a city, town or small island. In, on the other hand, is used in front of continents, states, nations, regions and larger island. So you'd say a Roma, a New York, a Cipro. But you would say in Italia, in Europa, in Sicilia. We use in before the name of a street or square. Abito in Via del Corso. I live in Via del Corso. Incontriamoci in Piazza del Plebiscito. Let's meet in Plebiscito Square. We also use in with the names of shops. L'ho comprato in farmacia. I bought it at the drugstore. Sono in pasticceria. I am at the cake shop. Sto andando in edicola. I'm going to the newsstand. Besides these tips, like many other Italian grammar points, there are no fixed rules, but there is a list of expressions using in or a, so you can start getting used to them. Sono a scuola, a casa, a letto, a teatro, al cinema, al mare. I am at school, at home, in bed, at the theater, at the cinema, at the seaside. Sono in banca. In chiesa, in classe, in montagna, in città, in ufficio, in biblioteca. I am at the bank, at the church, in the class, in the mountains, in the city, in the office, at the library. Pretty interesting, right? If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below. A presto! See you soon! Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, what's the difference between da and di? 
da and di are two Italian prepositions. They have multiple functions and meanings and sometimes it's not easy to choose the right one. For example, both da and di can be translated as from, but they are not interchangeable. Let's see the difference. Di specifies the future or origin of something, usually with the verb essere, to be. Da indicates the movement from somewhere. So you can say, di dove sei? Where are you from? Sono di Roma. I'm from Rome. But, da dove vieni? Where do you come from? Vengo da Roma. I come from Rome. This is because the verb venire, to come, is a verb of movement. Da is also used to indicate movement toward a place or a person. For example, sono stato dal dottore. I've been to the doctors. Sto andando da Paolo. I'm going to Paolo's house. Da also has the meaning of at or to, as in these examples. Da Mario non c'è la televisione. At Mario's place there is no television. Sandra è dal parrucchiere. Sandra is at the hairdressers. Many restaurant names also use this pattern. For example, da Michele, Micheles. Pretty interesting, right? If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below. A presto, see you soon. Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, when do I need to add the terminative articles to possessives? In English, you don't use the article de before a possessive adjective or pronoun. However, in Italian, the definite article is part of the possessive. It isn't optional. Also, remember that possessives must agree in number and gender with the nouns of the own thing, not with the noun indicating the owner. So we say, il mio cane, my dog. Mio is singular masculine because cane is singular masculine. La tua casa, your house. Tua is singular feminine because casa is singular feminine. I suoi genitori, his, her parents. Suoi is plural masculine because genitori is plural masculine and so on. However, there are times when we drop the determinative articles in front of possessive adjectives. One time is before nouns or close family members. We say mia madre, my mom, tuo padre, your dad, suo fratello, her brother, sua sorella, his sister, nostra nonna, our grandma, vostra cugina, your cousin. Exception to these are with the third person plural, loro, their, la loro zia, their aunt, with plural nouns, i tuoi fratelli, your brothers, with modified nouns or if they are preceded by an adjective, la mia sorellina, my little sister, il mio caro zio, my dear uncle, il suo cugino italiano, his Italian cousin. Another case when Italian possessives don't need the article is when the possessive is after the noun or in idiomatic expressions. Mamma mia, oh my, mio dio, my god. Lastly, you don't need to add the article if the noun is already introduced by an indefinite adjective or a number. Here are two examples. Puoi invitare quel tuo amico alla festa. You can invite that friend of yours to the party. Loro sono due miei amici. They are two friends of mine. Pretty interesting, right? If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below. A presto, see you soon. Want to get cheat sheets, audiobooks, lessons, apps, and much more every month for free? Just click the link in the description to get your free language gifts of the month. Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, can I also make profession names feminine? Italian nouns have a gender. This means some are masculine and some are feminine. Generally, you can change a masculine noun into a feminine one by changing the article and the final vowel. For example, il bambino, meaning the child, is masculine. La bambina is feminine. 
Since gender in Italian language is such an important grammar category, the answer to the question is yes. Most of the time you can change profession names into feminine. Let's see how to do that. Profession ending in aio and iere change the ending to aia and iera. For example, fornaio, fornaia, baker, cameriere, cameriera, waiter, waitress. Professions ending in tore change the ending to trice. Attore, attrice, actor, actress. Profession ending in ista only change the article to specify the gender. Lo stilista, la stilista, the stylist. Il tassista, la tassista, the taxi driver. What about profession traditionally involving men? Society is constantly evolving and the language must keep up with the times. Today, more and more women are becoming lawyers, engineers, doctors, etc. Some of these titles have a regular feminine form in Italian, such as dottoressa, doctor, or direttrice, chief, manager. But what about other titles that were almost never used for women in Italian history, like ministro, minister, or presidente, president? It is la ministro or la ministra, la presidentessa or la presidente. Some professions have the feminine version ending in essa, but this form is often considered ironic or even derogatory. For example, I'd be better to say l'avvocato instead of l'avvocatessa, lawyer, and la vigile instead of la vigilessa, traffic officer. In the same way, la presidentessa is perceived as politically incorrect. So, when you're referring to a woman, use the masculine version with a feminine article instead. La presidente. Besides, nouns ending in ente and ante don't change in the feminine form. For example, cantante, singer. So, it's only natural that it should be la presidente. There are instances where the suffix essa doesn't have a negative undertone. So, it's perfectly okay to say poetessa poetess, and studentessa, student. As for ministro, the most common feminine version is il ministro, the minister. However, lately many people have argued that ignoring the gender of the woman who holds the title is politically incorrect as well. So you may also hear to read la ministro. But this form is also incorrect. Masculine nouns change to feminine by changing the final O to A. Nobody would say la maestro instead of la maestra, the teacher. So the best way to call a female minister is actually la ministra. Professions that borrow English words only change the article. Il manager, la manager. Il designer, la designer. Il leader, la leader. One final thing, in colloquial Italian, when referring to a woman by her family name, it's common to add the feminine article la, the. For example, la Rossi. Although this is something very common, it's politically incorrect because it highlights the gender of the person you're referring to only when the person is feminine. It's as if in English, when referring to a woman instead of just using her family name, like Smith, you said, Smith, the woman. Pretty interesting, right? If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below. A presto! See you soon! Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, where should I put the adjective? Usually, descriptive adjectives in Italian are placed after the noun they modify. For example, la mela rossa, the red apple, il tavolo verde, the green table. However, sometimes you can put an adjective before the noun. There isn't a fixed rule for when you can invert the order, but here is a tip. The adjective put after the noun is denotative. The meaning is literal.
the adjective put before the noun is connotative. The meaning is suggestive. Let's see some examples. Un calciatore grande can be translated as a big footballer. The meaning here is literal. The guy is tall and well set. Un grande calciatore means a great footballer. The meaning here is figurative. We don't know if the guy is short or tall. The important thing is he never misses a goal. Un vecchio amico and un amico vecchio are both translated as an old friend in English, but they are not the same. When vecchio is before the noun, it means long-standing. When it's after the noun, it means advanced in years. Here's another example. Ho visto un nuovo film. Here, nuovo has the same meaning as another. I've seen another movie. Ho visto un film nuovo. Here, nuovo is used in its literal meaning. I've seen a new movie. Sometimes the meaning doesn't change, regardless of where you put the adjective. For example, una bella poesia or una poesia bella both mean a beautiful poem. However, some adjectives always come after the noun. These include adjectives that specify color, shape, nationality, religion, category. Occhi azzurri, blue eyes. Una scatola quadrata, a square box. Un ragazzo americano, an American boy. Adjectives that come from the present participle, they end in ante or ente, or from the past participle, ending in uto, ato, ito. For example, un essere vivente, a living being, un sole abbagliante, a dazzling sun, un libro bruciato, a burnt book, un paese voluto, a developed country. Adjectives modified by a suffix ino, etto, uccio, accio, etc. Un bambino piccolino, a tiny child, un colore giallastro, a yellowish color. Finally, here is something that may surprise you. English adjectives occur in a specific order. Quantity, quality, size, age, and so on. In Italian, on the other hand, the order doesn't really matter when there is more than one adjective. So, if you want to say a beautiful, tall, young woman, you can say una donna bella, alta e giovane, or una donna giovane, alta e bella, or una donna alta, giovane e bella, and other combinations too. Pretty interesting, right? If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below. A presto, see you soon! Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, what does it mean when people say that Italian is a Romance language? Well, in this case, Romance probably isn't the kind of Romance that you are thinking of, with hearts, roses and people falling in love. Romance actually refers to a family of languages. The Romance family is originally from Western and Southern Europe. For example, you might have noticed that Spanish and French are very similar to Italian, especially when they compare to other languages. You are seeing the family resemblance. They are all Romance languages. And their common ancestor is Latin. Latin is an ancient language and it's no longer widely used as part of public life. Latin emerged on the Italian peninsula as early as the 8th century BC. After the collapse of the Roman Empire, some 12 centuries later, vernacular forms of the language were given new space to develop. During the early modern period, emerging nation-states standardized these forms and made them into the Romance languages we know today. These Romance languages later spread from Europe to Africa, the Americas and even as far as Southeast Asia and Oceania. Italian has actually stayed the closest to its Latin roots, especially in terms of vocabulary. Romance languages farther away from Italy aren't quite as close to Latin as Italian, but they share the same roots. That's why Romance languages are sometimes also called 
New Latin Languages. Pretty cool, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. A presto! Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, how are verbs conjugated? English verbs are not heavily inflected. In fact, there are just three endings you can add to the infinitive of regular verbs. S for the third person singular present tense, for example, plays. ING for the gerund, playing, and ID for the past tense, played. Most combinations of tense, aspect, mood, and voice can be expressed using auxiliary and modal verbs. Italian, on the other hand, is a heavily inflected language. Italian verbs have lots of different endings depending on their subject, tense, and mood. The infinitive is the unconjugated form of the verb, the one you'll find in the dictionary. Italian verbs are divided into three main conjugation groups according to their infinitive endings. Verbs of the first conjugation end in are, for example, parlare meaning to speak. Verbs of the second conjugation in ere, for example, leggere meaning to read. Verbs of the third conjugation end in ire, for example, dormire, meaning to sleep. Each group has a different and regular conjugation pattern. Even if there are a lot of irregular verbs, most Italian verbs follow one of these three systems of conjugation. Each conjugation pattern has different endings you'll need to add to the verb stem. To get the stem of a verb, all you have to do is take away are, ere, or ire. So the stem of parlare is parl, the stem of leggere is legge, and the stem of dormire is dorm. Verb endings are affected by mood, tense, person, number, and sometimes even gender. Let's take a look. Italian verbs have four finite moods. They are the indicative, to express facts, for example, io dormo, I sleep. The imperative to give orders, for example, dormi, sleep. The subjunctive to express doubt, hope, fear, and possibility, for example, che io beva, I drink. The conditional to express an action that depends on another fact that may or may not happen, for example, io leggerei, I would read. There are also three non-finite moods, which usually have just one form. The infinitive, which is also the dictionary form, for example, parlare, to speak. The gerund for progressive tenses, for example, leggendo, reading. The participle, generally used as adjective or with the other verbs, for example, parlato, spoken. While moods shows the manner in which an action is expressed, the tense is what specifies when the action happens. The only Italian mood that has all eight tenses in the indicative, which is also the most used mood. The only present tense is the present, io parlo, I speak. Past tenses include present perfect, io ho parlato, I have spoken. Imperfect, io parlavo, I spoke. Past perfect, Io avevo parlato, I had spoken. Absolute past, io parlai, I spoke. Pre-trade perfect, io ebbi parlato, I had spoken. Future tenses are the future, io parlerò, I will speak. The future perfect, io avrò parlato, I will have spoken. The other moods only have a couple of tenses, usually present and past except for the subjunctive, which has a few more. This looks like a lot, and it actually is one of the most challenging things even for native speakers. But don't panic. If you get started with the regular verbs in the indicative present tense, you will soon familiarize yourself with the conjugation patterns. 
pretty interesting, right? Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, when should I use formal Italian? First, let's see what formal Italian is and how it works. During formal situations in English, you may prefer certain words over others, or you may avoid certain constructions, but you don't need to change pronouns or verb patterns. Italian, however, has two different language registers, a formal or polite one, an informal or casual one. When addressing someone formally, you have to use a different pronoun and a different verb conjugation. The most important thing to remember is that the English second person singular you is translated as to in informal situations. In formal situations, it's translated as lei. Lei is also the third person singular feminine or she, but in formal speech, it's used to address people of both sexes. So, if you are formally addressing a man using lei, make sure that the related verbs or adjectives are in the masculine form. Let's see an example. If you want to ask, how are you in Italian? You have two options. Tu, come stai, is informal speech, and lei, come sta, is formal speech. Subject pronouns can often be omitted because the verb endings reveal the subject, so it's vital to conjugate the verbs accordingly. Here's another example. Mario, sei andato in vacanza? Which means, Mario, did you go on vacation? This is casual Italian. Mario, è andato in vacanza? Also means, Mario, did you go on vacation? But it's polite. You may want to use the first one with a friend of yours and the second one with someone much older than you. Now, back to the original question. When will you need to use informal Italian? Usually, Italians tend to be friendly and informal, so they often avoid using formal speech, especially among young people. However, polite Italian is better when you meet someone for the first time or when speaking to older people or to someone in a higher business position than you. In the past, it was common to use voi, which is the second person plural pronoun, as a formal way of addressing someone. Nowadays, lei is the standard formal pronoun, but you may happen to hear also voi in some parts of southern Italy. Pretty interesting, right? If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below. A presto! Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, what's the difference between sono and sto? If you study Italian, you may often come across sentences such as sto bene, grazie, meaning I'm fine, thanks, or sono italiana, which means I'm Italian. Sono is a conjugated form of the verb essere. Sto is a conjugated form of the verb stare. Now, both Italian verbs essere and stare can be translated as to be in English, but they are used differently. Essere is a direct equivalent of to be. Generally, it expresses a condition. You can use it for lots of different things like identity, as in sono Paola, I'm Paola, profession, as in sono un insegnante, I'm a teacher, nationality, as in sono italiana, I'm Italian, physical aspects, as in sono alta, I'm tall, emotions, as in sono felice, I'm happy. On the other hand, the meaning of the verb stare depends on the context we use it in. Let's see some of the most common ones. To be, as in sto bene, I'm well. To stay, as in oggi sto a casa, I'll stay home today. To fit, as in la maglietta non mi sta, the t-shirt doesn't fit me. To stand, stare in piedi, to lie, stare sdraiato. Also, a lot of idiomatic expressions use stare instead of essere 
For example, stai zitto, be quiet, stai fermo, be still, stai attento, be careful. Stare is also used with the germ verb forms in progressive tenses. For example, sto studiando italiano means I'm studying Italian or stavano correndo meaning they were running. To sum it up, we could say that stare refers to something that happens while essere refers to something that is. Here is another tip. Keep in mind that sto is commonly used with adverbs as in sto bene, I am doing well, sono isn't. Sono can be used only with adjectives and in sono italiana, I am Italian. Pretty interesting, right? If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below. A presto, see you soon. Hi everybody, Marika here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Italian questions. The question for this lesson is, how can I use the particle ci? The Italian word ci can have different roles and thus different meanings. It can be a personal pronoun for the first person plural. In this case, it means us. Here are some examples. Paolo ci ha invitato alla festa. Paolo invited us to the party. La nonna ci leggeva dei libri. Grandma used to read us books. You have to use ci with reflexive and reciprocal verbs when referring to the first person plural, we. Let's consider the reflexive verb svegliarsi, to wake up. We wake up at 6. In Italian, that's ci svegliamo alle 6. Here is another example with iscriversi, which means to enroll. We enrolled at the university. An example of ci used with a reciprocal verb is the well-known expression ci vediamo. This stands for see you soon but literally means we'll see each other. Ci can also be an adverb of place, meaning there. Let's see a couple of examples. Someone asks you, Quando vai in biblioteca? When do you go to the library? You could answer, Ci vado tutti i giorni. This means, I go there every day. Another example, Ci sono molte regole in italiano. There are a lot of rules in Italian. Lastly, sometimes ci takes the place of noun phrases introduced by the preposition a, especially with certain verbs. Let's see a few examples. First, let's consider pensare a, which means to think about. You may hear non ci pensare, meaning don't think about it. Here, ci may stay for a quel problema, about that problem. Next is credere a, to believe in. You may hear ci credo, this means I believe in that. Here ci may stand for addio, in God, or alla notizia, meaning in the news. Last, let's see giocare a, to play at. Ci hai mai giocato? Means, have you ever played at it? Here, ci may stand for a questo gioco, at this game. It's not as difficult as you thought, right? If you have any more questions, please leave us a comment. Ci vediamo, see you soon!